I want you to do something. I want you to stand to your feet. We're standing all over the house. I began to think about old school and uh, just things about old school. And a few years ago, Dr. Billy Graham's grandson, Will, is a good friend of mine. And it was my birthday and we were in North Carolina and Will said, Benny, for your birthday, I wanna, I wanna give you something. And uh, he said, I've got a special gift for you that I bet you don't have. He said, I wanna give you one of Papa Bill's Bibles. And so uh, today, as we read our text, we're gonna read it after the great preacher, out from the great preacher, Billy Graham's Bible. It's found in Exodus, Exodus chapter six, verse six and seven. This is what God's word says. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from the bondage. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Let us pray. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I want to thank you for this day. I pray today that you would speak to us and through us. I pray today that you would give your word a free course to travel. I pray for that man, woman, boy, or girl who's here today that doesn't know you as personal Savior, that today would be the day they come to know you. And for all you do, I'm going to praise you. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Folks, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about the Passover celebration. The Passover celebration. Speaking of Billy Graham, Billy Graham said that when he started out preaching, when he took his Bible and he started out preaching, he said after he had preached for a little while, he said, uh, professor at Cornell University sent him a letter. And he said that professor said to him, you have great charisma, Mr. Graham, and you're a great orator and you have great abilities. And he said, I see you being very successful in the preaching ministry. I see you being very successful. But he said, I'd like to give you one piece of advice. He said, leave that preaching about the blood out. If you just leave that preaching about the blood out, you'll be more successful. Billy Graham said upon receiving that letter, I was more determined to preach on the blood of Jesus than ever before. I was more determined to preach on the blood of Jesus than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm more determined to preach on the blood of Jesus than ever before because I know in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, now stick with me today. If you'll stick with me, I believe you will leave saying, uh, I'm not only inspired, but I'm a little bit informed. The Jewish people began with a man by the name of Abraham. It was a covenant between God and Abraham. And you know the story, God said to Abraham, I'm gonna bless you like the, I'm gonna bless your seed like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Abraham was 100 years old and he had a son. His name was Isaac. And Isaac had a son and his name was Jacob, Jacob. But the Bible tells us in Genesis 32, 28, that Jacob's name was changed. His name was changed to Israel. That's how we get Israel. So Jacob or Israel, either one you wanna go, had 12 sons. His fourth son was a son that he named Judah. And from that word Judah, which means praise, we get the word Jew. 
But remember, he had 12 sons. He not only had Judah, but he had eight more. And his 11th son was a man by the name of Joseph. And the other brothers were jealous of Joseph. I mean, this sibling rivalry, it was there. And they sold him as a slave. And he ended up 400 miles from Israel in Egypt. But there was a famine in the land. And all the Jews go to Egypt. And they're living there. And Joseph's over the food supply. And he's giving out food. But there's a problem. There's one little verse. It's in Exodus 1 and 8. It said, there arose a new king who knew not Joseph. And that new king came into power and he said, I'll tell you, all these Jews are coming here and they're going to overtake my Egyptian kingdom. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make slaves out of them. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why for 400 years, the Israeli people were slaves. For 400 years, they were working, building bricks. They were working, making bricks. They were in the heat because they were just slaves. But finally, a man comes along by the name of Moses. And God said to Moses, I want you to lead my people out of this bondage. I don't want them to be slaves anymore. And Moses said, what do, what, what do we do, God? And he said, this is what we're going to do. He said, Moses, I want you to tell the people, every household of Israel, to take a lamb, just a, a baby lamb. And he said, what I want them to do is I want them to sacrifice that baby lamb. And I want them to take that blood from that baby lamb and I want them to put it on the top of their house. Take hyssop. You remember when Jesus was on the cross, folks? They, they took hyssop and put, the, put it to his mouth. Hyssop. You, 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 you take hyssop and you put blood over the top of the doorpost. And you put blood on the side of the doorpost. You say, Preacher Benny, why, why did they tell him to put blood over the top? And why did they tell him to put blood on each side? It was the cross. You put blood on the top. You put blood on the, each side. Because God said, I'm going to send a death angel. And the death angel is literally going to smite or kill the firstborn, the oldest boy in every Egyptian household. It's going to cause great confusion and will allow you all to escape. But he said, make sure at every Israeli household, you put blood on the doorpost. Because when I see the blood, <laughs> I, I, I believe if a mosquito would bite me right now, it would leave singing there's power in the blood. Amen? <laughs> look here, look here. When, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now look, I told you that leader Moses led the people. From Moses to Jesus was 1,400 years. And every year, even to this day, folks, the Jewish people celebrate Passover. There's seven feasts that the Jewish people celebrate to this day. But their most important feast is still this feast. It's the Passover feast. It's when he passed over. He passed over and protected the children of Israel. Now understand something. The not that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. You said, Preacher Benny, what were they doing in the upper room? 
I'll tell you what they were doing in the upper room. Jesus wasn't Mexican. All right, Jesus wasn't Caucasian or American. Jesus was Jewish. And he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And when they were celebrating the Passover, he was saying to them, guys, this is the final Passover because there'll be no more need for a yearly sacrifice. Because from this point on, I am the eternal Passover. <laughs> you say, Preacher Benny, can, can you prove that in the Bible? Well, look what 1 Corinthians 5 says, says. For even Christ, wait, our Passover is sacrifice for us. Now, 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 I began to think about, so he became the Passover lamb, and I, I'm trying to hurry. What qualified him to be the Passover lamb? Well, let me give you three quick things. First of all, the Passover lamb had to be spotless. When, when the people offered up a sacrifice, he said, don't you bring one that's lame or blind. You bring a lamb that's without spot or blemish. The, the, the priest had to examine the lamb. Even as the sacrificial sacrifices started in the temple, they had to examine the lamb because the Bible says in Exodus 12 and 5, <laughs> it had to be spotless. Folks, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish. Oh, listen, I'm about to run. But as a lamb without blemish and without spot. I just stopped by to tell you this morning, he was the spotless lamb of God, the spotless lamb of God. But oh, not only was the lamb spotless, but I want you to know something. That little lamb, that little lamb had to be slaughtered. What does that mean, preacher? Well, when they would bring the lamb, the high priest would cut the throat. And that little lamb, they would have a, a, a basin down there, and that little lamb, the blood would, would bleed out. It, it literally would, 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 would bleed out to death. And after that little lamb bled out, they would skin that lamb. They'd skin that little lamb and they'd hang that little lamb on a hook and its forearms would be spread out. And then it would be roasted. You hear me? That little lamb wasn't just killed. That little lamb was slaughtered. Jesus wasn't just killed. According to Isaiah 53, verse 7, wait, he was slaughtered. Six hours. Oh, folks, the, the artists are kind. The artists are kind when we show the pictures the passion of Christ. He, he, he literally was slaughtered, beaten beyond measure. The Bible says literally, you couldn't tell if he was a human or an animal. He didn't have clothes, he was humiliated. He hung naked, slaughtered. The lamb was not only spotless and slaughtered, but the lamb had to be shared. I'm talking about Exodus chapter 12, verses three and four. Do you realize, folks, get this. If you read Exodus chapter 12, verses three and four, every household had to offer up a lamb for their sin. But let me explain. Every bit of that lamb had to be eaten. 
You read Exodus 12, 3 and 4. Every bit of that lamb had to be eaten. So if you had a small household and you couldn't eat all the lamb, you had to go to your neighbor and say, listen, this has got to be eaten. I've got to share it because none of it can go to waste. John said, behold, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The Lamb has got to be shared. The Lamb has got to be shared. The Lamb of glory has got to be shared. Somebody said, oh, I don't want to go down to Rock Springs. That church is too big. No church can be too big because people are still dying and going to hell. And the lamb has got to be shared. We've got to share the lamb, the lamb, the hope of the world. Now, wait. When the Jewish people celebrate Passover, even to this day, ladies and gentlemen, they don't have one cup, but they have four cups of wine. Four cups. Because every cup represents something. When they celebrate Passover, they drink from four cups, and they read Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. <laughs> you say, preacher? What are the four cups that they drink from at Passover? The first cup they drink from is the cup of salvation. The cup of salvation. Look what the Bible says. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. They, 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 they think about the salvation and what God has done for them. Ladies and gentlemen, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we ought to think about what God's done for us. We ought to think about that we were on our way to hell, but now we're on our way to heaven. We ought to think about we had no peace in our lives, but now we have peace in our lives. We ought to think about that we used to have a under the bondage of sin, but God completely forgave our sins. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we ought to thank Him for our salvation. I want to say today, I thank God for salvation. I'm, glad, I'm so glad that God thought it. Jesus brought it. The blood bought it. The Bible taught it. The, the, the Holy Spirit wrought it. The devil fought it. But one night about midnight, I caught it. And I'm glad I got saved because Jesus changed my life. Yeah, God formed me, sin deformed me, religion tried to reform me, education tried to inform me, but I found only Jesus Christ can transform me. Only Jesus can change a life. Spurgeon the great preacher. Spurgeon the great preacher from days gone by. He said these words. He said, morality may keep you out of jail but only the blood of Jesus will keep you out of hell, amen? Morality may keep you out of jail, but only the blood of Jesus shall keep you out of hell. Now wait, the Jewish people, I gotta hurry. <laughs> cup one is the cup of salvation, but many of us stop there. I just gotta be honest with you. I know I'm biased, but I think I'm preaching better than you're responding. <laughs> Look, many of us stop with a cup of salvation because all we really wanted anyway was fire insurance. All we wanted was enough of Jesus to get us out of hell. Now, I don't know how it was with you. I'm only telling you how it was with Benny Tate. I don't know how it was with you. I'm only telling you how it was with Benny Tate. I didn't need enough of Jesus just to get me out of hell. I needed enough of Jesus to get the hell out of me. 
See, I found out it took God one day to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. You say, preacher, well, what are you talking about? Well, read what the Bible says. We're forced saying to the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage. <laughs> it's the cup of deliverance. <laughs> See folks, he not only wants you to experience the cup of salvation, but he wants you to experience the cup of deliverance. See, God, God, God wants to give you victory over what's pulling you down. God, God wants to give you victory. See, see, look here, folks. Cup one is an event. Cup two is a process. Cup one is about you going to heaven. Cup two is about your quality of life while you're on the way. See, I know tons of people. They've, they've got to cup one, but they've never got to cup two. You say, preacher, why have they got, not got to cup two? Because let me tell you what, bitterness still controls them. Lust still controls them. Greed still controls them. Pornography still controls them. Anger still controls them. Animosity still controls them. Guilt still controls them. See, they've experienced cup one, but they've never experienced cup two. And God wants you to get not only cup one, but God wants you to have victory and get you to cup two. You say, I can't relate to this. Well, you can't relate to it. I'll tell you who could. Look what the great apostle Paul said. He said, you know, I purpose in my heart that I'm going to do good. And when I do, evil shows up. Has that ever happened to you? Man, I'm trying to do better, but look here, evil shows up. I want to quit cussing, but evil shows up. I, I, I want to quit doing that at work, but evil shows up. I want to quit doing that on Friday night, but evil shows up. I, I want to quit doing that with the crowd. <laughs> if you hang around a barbershop, you're going to get a haircut. You might want to focus on where you're going. Because when I want to do good, evil showed up. You say, well, pastor, what, what, what do you think? Of, what do you think the secret is? What, what, what is the secret to all this? It's the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. See, unless there is within you that which is above you, you'll soon yield to that which is around you. You don't have the power in your own strength to do it. You only have the power to do it through leaning into the Holy Spirit. Now wait. You got cup number one. Many of you are just right there. You never got past cup one. Some of you, you're, you're right here around cup two. And then we get to cup three. What's cup three about it's the cup of purpose. Look what the Bible says. And I will redeem you. What, what, Pastor, what does that mean, redeem? It means to buy something back for its original purpose. See, sin, sin will steal the purpose that God has for your life. Sin will steal the purpose that God has for your life. But, but listen real close. You were made on purpose for a purpose. You were made on purpose for a purpose. You're not one in a million. You're one of a kind. And God made you, look here, and, and I'll move to the next point. But God made you a unique person. And God put in you a unique passion because he made you for a unique purpose. Listen, a job may be what you get paid for, but a calling's what you were made for. 
And God's got a purpose for every person's life. And he said, I've redeemed you. I I want you to quit doing what you're doing. When you celebrate the Lord's Supper, realize I've redeemed you. I've made you just like you are for the purpose I want you to do. Let me give you cup four and I'm done. No, I'm not. (laughs) It's the cup of family. Look what that verse says. And I will take you to me for a people. Wait. Not for a person. But wait. I'll take you for a family. God said... I want to save you. I want to deliver you. I want to give you a purpose. And I want you to be a part of a family. I want to save you. I want to deliver you. I want to give you a purpose. Because I want you to be a part of a family. You said, Preacher Benny, look, look, this is my hand. I appreciate this hand. But if you cut it off and put it out in the yard, (laughs) it's really not valuable. Why? Because it's disconnected from the body. And why do you think I push and preach and beg and say, let's don't play ball every Sunday? Why, why do you think I'm imp- saying to people, because what happens? The devil wants to disconnect you from the family because he knows if he can disconnect you from the family, you're not going to be effective for him. All he's got to, look, all he's got to do is disconnect you from the family. Right. Now look, so, so Pastor Benny, it's important that I'm a part of the family. Let me give you three quick reasons. Number one, <laughs> contribution. When you mention that word, everybody says, oh, he's talking about giving. Well, (laughs) no, that's really not in my mind if you knew. But look, folks, everybody needs to contribute to the family. My mother lives in McMinnville, Tennessee. She actually was going to a Presbyterian church. And I would call her and say, Mama, are you going to church tomorrow? Yes, I am, son. I've got to go tomorrow. Why do you have to go tomorrow, Mama? We're having lunch after service. <laughs> Pastor Harry's already called me. So Pastor Harry Green called you. It's a small church. She said, yes, he called me, son. He said, Melba, I want to make sure you're going to be there tomorrow. You are going to bring the fried okra, aren't you? She said, son, none of them women over there know how to fry okra. (laughs) Now, I don't know that they needed fried okra, but you know what Pastor Harry knew? He knew my mother needed it. And look, I could care less if you've got more degrees than a thermometer. You need it too. Because the greatest need any person has is the need to be needed. See, a family's about contribution. It's about community. You know why the devil wants to destroy the relationships in your life? Because he knows how desperately you need them. And it's about celebration. It's about coming together and worshiping the Lord. Now get this. Pastor Benny, today you've preached about the blood. Why does the blood mean so much to you? I see everything, folks. Larry Ballard, good to see you. He's in the foyer. I see everything. 
You say, I'm going to slip out early. I'll know it. (laughs) Why, Why does the blood mean so much to you, Pastor Benny? Because it justifies. Because Romans 5 and 9 says it justifies. What does that mean? It means all the sin that I've done in my life. When God sees me, it means just as if I've never sinned. I know what I've done, but God said, I don't see it. It's just as if you've never sinned. It not only justifies, but it heals. See, the blood of Jesus heals our bodies, but most people don't realize the blood of Jesus heals your emotions. The blood of Jesus heals your mind because Hebrews 9 and 14 says, it will purge your conscience. It will purge your conscience. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath the flood. Oh, they lose all their guilty stain. That guilt of the conscience, it's gone because of the blood of Jesus. Hey, let me give you two more. The blood keeps on cleansing. First John 1 and 7 says, but if we walk in the light, no, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth. It doesn't say has cleansed. It says it's still potent. Listen, it says it's still potent and will never ever lose its power. It just keeps on cleansing, folks. It just keeps on cleansing. It just keeps on cleansing. Oh, it just keeps on cleansing. It just keeps on cleansing. And I'm done. But the blood of Jesus gives us power over Satan. <laughs> it gives us power over Satan. You just claim the blood, folks. You just claim the blood. You said, preacher, where do you get that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Amen. Thank God for his blood. <laughs> this morning, about five o'clock, I was running. And I was singing, I claim the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. Those precious bloodstains were made there just for me. For all my sin, my sickness, and my pain. When I need healing, I just claim those precious bloodstains. Folks, today, let's claim the blood, amen? Can we just today, let's just claim the blood. Today, let's just claim the blood. Yes, let's just praise him for his blood. Can we stand our feet and just praise him for his blood?